welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica, your host for today's episode. Imagine this scenario. You take on a new role and you're knocking it out of the park, getting positive feedback from your managers and leaders. So you decide to ask for and create a new role that plays to your strengths and would elevate your team. Your idea is well received, but instead of you for the role, you're told they'd prefer someone else. What would you do? Well, in today's episode, you'll hear how our guest, Gail Firestein, Chief People Officer at Castle, decided to advocate for herself early in her career, garner support from other leaders, and ultimately get the role she proposed. Gail is a seasoned senior HR and tech executive with extensive international experience, transforming organizations in large-scale public companies and cutting-edge startups in finance, education, and retail. Gail spent several years as the Senior Vice President, Product and Technology HR Business Partner at Pearson Education, and had a successful 25-year career at Goldman Sachs, where she was Managing Director in Technology and Human Capital Management. Gail is a board member, secretary, and nominating committee chair at InPower, whose mission is to bring the tech community together for social good by creating pathways to economic prosperity by launching digital careers for veterans and young adults from underserved communities. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Gail. Welcome, Gail. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. I am super excited to have you on. Um, It's always wonderful to have very amazing and insightful individuals on, but it's even more special when you have someone who you consider a lifelong mentor and sponsor uh, in my career. So I'm super excited for our audience to get to meet you. So without further ado, um, tell our audience a little bit about who you are and a little bit about your story and what you've learned along your journey. Yeah, hi, Monica. Thanks so much for having me and uh, so proud of what (laughs) you're doing with Beyond Barriers and really so excited for this opportunity uh, to work with you on this and to uh, have this discussion. It's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh gosh, where should I begin? Um, I always talk about myself as someone who uh, is both tech, a tech person and an HR person. Mm-hmm. Right? That's been my career for uh, 25 plus years, almost 30 years. Um, I did start out as a software developer, uh, you know, right out of school. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my career, though, took a lot of different twists and turns. It wasn't a straight line, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, so I started off as a software developer, and back then, no one knew what that was. Uh, you know, something right. that my dad actually said to me, learn how to code. Not everyone's going to be able to do that. And because he was a coder, right? uh-huh. he was working with the big computers that took up, you know, warehouses and stuff. No mm-hmm. one understood that at the time, especially a woman, right? Forget right. it. Like it right. was, was all geek, you know, geeky stuff. <laughs> And I did like Star Trek, though. Um, anyway, I, um, I listened to him. So that was like the first lesson learned, right? Mm-hmm. Listen to your dad. Now, <laughs> not your dad, you know, have someone who, that you trust, who knows you really well, mm-hmm. and, you know, take their advice, especially when you're starting out, you know, mm-hmm. they probably have a bit more sage uh, advice and experience. Mm-hmm. So um, that uh, got me into uh, Merrill Lynch's IT uh, entry-level training program, Mm -hmm. because I really did kind of like it. And um, so I spent some time there. And uh, after, I don't know, a year or two, I went over to Goldman Sachs, where I had Mm -hmm. 25 years of working with wonderful people and many, many uh, fantastic experiences. And... um, one of the reasons I left, uh, or I joined Goldman Sachs, actually, was because I saw it as an opportunity to take something that I was sort of a hobby. Mm-hmm. I studied Japanese 
uh, in college. Uh-huh. And I went on this exchange program and it was sort of, you know, I was a Japanophile. I kind of was just interested in it. Uh-huh. And uh, Goldman uh, offered me this job in this new uh, group called IT, uh, International IT or something. Wow, okay. They were just uh-huh. you know, building out in uh, London and Tokyo specifically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, jumped at that and wanted to work in the city and live in the city, New York City. Uh-huh. So it was a big, big move. Um, so about a year in, um, after going out on a lot of trips to Japan, I kind of went to my manager and said, you know, I think you should send me there. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I go, yeah, like, I should work there. I, you know, the business needs are there. I'm the right person. I understand. I can mm-hmm. bridge, uh-huh. right? uh, bridge between um, Asia, Tokyo, and New York. And right. he thought it was a great idea. But his manager, or the head of the department, he said, I'll never forget this, what a great idea, but I want to send Joe, not you. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> right? And I was uh-huh. like, whoa. <laughs> uh-huh. So here we're kind of getting on to lesson number two. You mm-hmm. know, that it was really, um, and I was probably very naive. I was still very early in my career, and it probably mm-hmm. benefited me that I was rather naive about all the politics, right, mm-hmm. and, and, and all that. But it... It made me like really, I was very con- had conviction that mm-hmm. I was the right person and this was the right thing to do. And I advocated for myself and I got people behind me. Mm-hmm. And I learned that lesson early on, right, mm-hmm. from that experience. And as I said, it was probably best that I didn't know about office politics too much because I probably would have gotten caught up in it too right. much. But I really just stayed true and authentic and advocated for myself. And I think... That, you know, that's what made it happen. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they obviously sent me there, newly married, right? One of the first expats. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> and um, you know, it was quite an experience for my husband and I. And mm-hmm. we stayed about four years. Um, and, uh, you know, after four years, we said, you know, it's time to, you know, get back. Uh-huh. Um, Balancing both of our careers, and I think for him it was important to get back to the states and get his kind of career where he wanted it to be. Right. And so here's where you know at lesson number three. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. You know, I you know made the decision to return to return. There wasn't a role uh, mm-hmm. in New York at the time that was like really the next kind of big step. Up. Right. But, you know, I built a lot of um, what I call credit in the bank, right? Mm-hmm. I you know, delivered a lot. I uh, put the Tokyo IT and technology uh, office and teams on the map as part of a global, mm-hmm. you know, global, te- global team. So I had a lot of credibility. Um, so I, and I also trusted uh, the relationship that I had with mm-hmm. the CIO who I worked for that will, um, you know, figure something out. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty, you know, unnerving, right? We, we moved back. I took on, you know, certain projects. Mm-hmm. Didn't really have like a real home role yet. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, after six months, um, I got a really big job step up in mm-hmm. my career. And so I think the thing to take away from there is to have some patience, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, and, and there were certain... Things, certain ground rules that I thought were important during that transition. Mm-hmm. Right, one is, one was, you know, I wanted to stay part of the technology leadership team. Mm-hmm. Right? I felt that was essential, right? right? Even though the things I was doing may not have been the big scope, large organizations, but mm-hmm. it was, you know, definitely a transition. Mm-hmm. And um, I needed to be, I needed to have my profile, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of up there. I didn't want to lose the profile I had gained you right. know, over, you know, the prior period of time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to like, you, you know, bring that to the table pretty transparently. Mm-hmm. Right? right. But also, you know, understand, okay, then it may take some time, right? You can't mm-hmm. be so demanding. Right. Right. Um, but you have to let people know what your kind of baseline is going to be. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, so I got a nice uh, role running a large, you know, tech group. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was for a business that was known as the Wild West, <laughs> <laughs> the trading organizations that was uh-huh. a lot of innovative 
uh, things in, uh, in the trading space. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was pretty intense uh, for a couple of years. And, That's fantastic, um, yes. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, the last lesson I do want to impart is sort of the next thing that happened. Mm-hmm. And then um, take a break and you could ask some more questions. Certainly. Um, but, you know, a couple of years into that, you know, we were approaching kind of uh, the first dot-com right? mm-hmm. tech, tech, you know, industries are emerging. And mm-hmm. the tech division at Goldman was several thousand people globally. It was very large. Mm-hmm. Goldman wasn't yet really known, right? It was if you were a banker or a trader. Right. Of course, you would know Goldman, but not like today. Right. Um, and uh, we were having a lot of trouble uh, retaining and, and attracting tech talent. Mm-hmm. And it was at a very critical time for the division where we were bringing in new tools and architecting new, um, <clears throat> new technology. Uh, we needed new skills. Right. And so the uh, CIO asked me and some other colleagues to help solve this problem. Right. So just to, you know, we, we ended up creating a, um, a career pathing framework you know, with the mm. help of some consultants, but it was right. kind of a new idea. And uh, it was pretty, you know, we implemented it. it. It was a way to tell people interested in technology what kind of career, right? right? And the different kinds of careers you could have um, at an investment bank, mm-hmm. right? And also internally at Goldman, it was important to show where we had to how did we fit a career path for this new emerging technology right. talent sector mm-hmm. into what banking traditionally right. had, right? They didn't really mesh together. Mm-hmm. So we had to kind of make it mesh a little mm-hmm. bit. And so we, we implemented it and that was it. I went back to my, you know, day job. Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, you know, I get the, kind of the one-on-one status meeting, get the question, I'd like you to do something and you could say no if you want to. Right. <laughs> you know, you really can't. You say really no. can't say no, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the uh, leadership in tech really wanted to invest in mm-hmm. continuing to build upon this career framework because we didn't build upon it. Mm-hmm. It would have just fizzled out, right? right? Everything was connected to it, you know, how you recruit, how you pay people, Mm -hmm. uh, how you uh, train and develop people, Mm -hmm. all of those things. And um, and there's a little bit of organization development, uh, organization design also that we needed to do because the division was growing so quickly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it was a new role. It was head of people strategy for the division. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the well-renowned human capital management division yet that we right. know about, uh-huh. but it was before that. Mm-hmm. Around the time Goldman went public, mm-hmm. so um, you know, I thought about it, um, and I talked to a lot of people, mm-hmm. uh, uh, people that were you know around the leadership table with me, who would be kind of my colleagues in a slightly different way. Right. And I talked to the business people that I was working with, um, and. Um, to me, it was like, okay, this is a strategic problem to solve, right? right. Like, why not? Mm-hmm. So what I took away from there and, and was lesson number four is that sometimes others see something in you that you may not see in yourself at yes. all, right? Mm-hmm. And you need to be open mm-hmm. for it. And as you know, I've said, lesson number two was I was advocating for myself. This was the right thing. And now right. This, last move, this, this move I just described was – Someone asked me to do something that was like nowhere near mm-hmm. you know, on my radar screen of something that I thought I would do. That's a fantastic point because I think, you know, just hearing from what you were saying in one, you had clarity at the very beginning of what your strengths were and kind of the, the what you wanted to do so you could advocate for yourself because you had that clarity. Um, and then through the work that you did and some of these special projects that you took on or that you said yes to kind of brought out some of these natural maybe um, abilities or talents that you had that you probably came so easy to you that you didn't realize them or see them as strengths, but somebody else did. Um, so share with me a little bit about, um, you know, how did you how did you kind of formulate that 
story around advocating for yourself and feeling confident to be able to, you know, even when you were saying some of the office politics of like, oh, I'd rather send Joe, not Gail. (laughs) But then, you know, you having that conviction to say, look, I know my strengths, my competencies, they lie here. I would add value here. Um, What, how did you, you know, how did you gain the confidence to be able to articulate that? That's a great, great insight and great question. Um, you know, I think, as I said, some of it was just not thinking about it too much, mm-hmm. right, in some ways. But also, um, I think being self-aware of what, what gives one, what gives you energy, mm. right? And usually right. confidence gives you energy, mm-hmm. right? And so that kind of your own personal little, like, barometer or, or you know, kind of where to go on mm-hmm. that. And just to kind of amplify your, your question and your point, this change where I was asked to go leave technology, right, and go mm-hmm. do this role that didn't exist anywhere yet, mm-hmm. right, and in a completely different industry. I mean, we right. didn't call it HR then, but it, it was, but we, mm-hmm. you know, we, didn't, we didn't know what to call it. It was just something we thought we needed. And so when I... Um, talk to a lot of people about, you know, should I do this? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, the strengths came out. Mm -hmm. But it also made me realize what areas I knew nothing about. Mm, Right. And what things I had to stretch. And I very, very deliberately and transparently talked about that. Mm. Because I felt that was key to the success because it managed expectations. Right. Right. It's great to be recognized for what you do, right? And the strengths and that, yes, those are things where day 10, you know, we right. could, you know, expect that I'll be able to know our business, right? right? Because I know the business. But on day 10, don't ask me to put a comp strategy together. Right. You know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. right. Or, or some other things, right? So there was mm-hmm. definitely um, understanding that self-awareness, Mm-hmm. Right, of uh, those stretch areas, but also transparently telling the people, your key stakeholders, what they're going to be. Because you may ask them for help, right? Right. And it also, you know, it, it sets those expectations. So I think that was really a very, a very key thing. And we don't always get the opportunity to have that, like, completely new thing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's kind of obvious that you don't know stuff. Right. Uh-huh. To try to, you know, take that in, even on something that's just seems maybe an incremental mm-hmm. thing, there's probably stuff that you have to learn and, and, and lean in and ask others. And that I think is so important because I find that, you know, with many of our listeners and many of the women who come through our programs, um, there is a fear or a limiting belief that if they're transparent and share with their stakeholders or their managers or leaders that they you know, lack a particular skill set or competency that it, they'll, you know, it's going to derail them instead. And I love how you, you know, how you use that actually as something positive to let them know, like, hey, like, I'm willing to do this, but here, like, you're very self-aware and being able to say, here's where I'm going to probably need some help. Um, what other techniques have you used in the past? Because you've taken on, you know, several, you know, extreme, you know, leadership roles, but you've also made transitions in, you know, industries, roles, etc. And I can't, you know, imagine sometimes the, the, the self-doubt that might creep in or the fears or the limiting beliefs. What are the techniques or what did you do to kind of snap yourself out of it and just lean into it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, on the, uh, air, just to close that area of, you know, being transparent on the stretch mm-hmm. areas, why to make it effective, mm-hmm. you also need to come up with what you're going to do about closing mm, this. Right. Okay. Right. So it's not just saying, oh, I don't know X, Y, Z. So there. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't know X, Y, Z, but this is what I'm going to do mm-hmm. right? uh, to learn about it or to mitigate the fact that I don't know. Right. And that right. could be maybe I need to hire someone. Right. Mm-hmm has some skills that I don't have, right? Or, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's important to not only go in with it, but, you know, what are you going to do about it? Right. 
So, um, so what you asked me, I'm sorry, what techniques? <laughs> no, it's definitely the techniques around, you know, you oh. taking on roles, you right. were being transparent on, you know, these are my gaps and this is what I'm going to do about it. But still mm -hmm. those moments of yeah. self-doubt, right. you know, how did you get past those? Yes. Um, yeah. So I tried to look at all of this as building blocks mm -hmm. and a learning moment. Mm. Okay. And again, feeling confident in what I'm bringing to the table, mm -hmm. right? Um, and trying to, I think they're just, um, so like, as I said earlier, my career was a bunch of curves. Uh -huh. Yet when you kind of look back at it, it actually makes 100% sense. Mm, right. And the things sort of just connected together. And so, um, you know, I felt that, every, that even something that I did, I'll give you an example. When I uh, left, I left Goldman, I went to a, a non-for-profit in a very, very different role. I was, uh, you know, speaking to my mission-based right. desires and a complete uh -huh. change uh, after Goldman. Uh, and so, but I did that for a few years. And then I went back into a more traditional kind of HR role, but in the education. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Right, so I had finance, Mm -hmm. Right, I did great. great. You know, you grow. I went to a non for profit to maybe you know to continue to give back. <laughs> right, uh -huh. and then you know the education uh, sector was a little bit of another bridge now. Right, mm -hmm. and, you know, still very much mission based, even though it was a for profit you know public company. Mm -hmm. But um, I was able to find parallels right mm. from my early days, particularly working in tech uh -huh. uh, at Goldman. Right? And one of the first things, you know, I did uh, in, this, uh, in this new role was to create a career path, right? Okay. But yes. it was of a slightly different flavor, right? It was mm -hmm. about digital transformation, right? Right. It was sort of going from book publishers, right? Mm -hmm. And what were sort of the uh, ways of working and all the processes um, mm -hmm. that you had to change when you right. were moving out of physical book publishing into digitizing. Mm -hmm. But I was able to kind of bring back, mm -hmm. you know, and make parallels between those two very seemingly very different experiences. Right. But there was a lot to leverage, right? And then kind of continued to learn upon, right? And, and to adapt. Right. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I think, you know, as, as you mentioned, you draw back, you kind of draw back on some of the experiences that you've done and knowing that you've it's, it's kind of one of those, you know, I've done it before, I can do it again, I just, there's a different flavor to it, but um, taking, taking what you've learned and applying it elsewhere, and I think that's fantastic. One of the questions that I had in terms of um, your kind of the career success around, you know, community and relationships that you've leveraged in the past, and be it, um, you know, influential leaders that kind of mentored you and coached you, mm -hmm. um, how did you... How did you build on those? How did you build on those relationships? And two, if you didn't have access to somebody who you wanted to learn from, how did you go about kind of creating that relationship with that person? Mm, okay. Wow. Okay. There's a couple of things in there. Yeah. Um, how did I, you know, I think uh, building relationships, first of all, takes time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, many of us, you know, been in large companies that have these sort of sponsorship or mentor programs, but I found uh, the better, the stronger relationships and the most um, impactful relationships are ones that happen more organically. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so, look, I think these mentoring programs are important to jumpstart, right, mm -hmm. and maybe get um, uh, the mentee used to having right. a, a relationship other than their direct manager. Right. right. So I think that's good. But I think it's really learning how to seek out, you know, mm -hmm. these mentors and sponsors kind of in your day-to-day. -day right. Work. Because mm -hmm. people that really see and work with you will have the best insight. Mm. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, on, but you have to build those relationships, and it all starts, you know, from trust. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so in some cases, some of the stronger and most trusted relationships were my kind of my business partners, mm -hmm. right? 
And we were able to establish um, that trust because I was building systems for them and helping them change their businesses. And, right. you know, you have some success with that and you could then, you know, go off and, and you know, you know, people move on, but you want to stay connected. And usually they're the ones that kind of help you, you know, right. in, that, in that next stage. So I, I just, you know, I feel, you know, just having that trusted relationship, delivering for people, that transparency, mm-hmm. um, and just knowing that's a two-way street mm-hmm. all the time, right? Whether you're a mentee, but you're also a mentor at the same time, or right. a protege and a sponsor. Right. right? They happen at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that um, those relationships that had that level of trust, it's a matter of you don't have to talk to those people all the time, but mm-hmm. you know that there was, you know, depth there that when you need to reach out for them, they're going to be there for you, mm-hmm. right? And I'll, I'll kind of just give you a recent, very recent example. Sure. You know, this past spring with um, the Black Lives Matter protests mm-hmm. happening and just everyone, you know, you knew something very, very different. Mm-hmm going on. And um, as my role at uh, Castle as a chief people officer, I knew it was my responsibility Mm -hmm. that everyone at the company, but in particular members of the black community, wants to have some kind of response. Mm -hmm. You know, look, you and I worked for years in in DNI. Right. And there was nothing that I don't, you know, we weren't quite prepared. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So that first, you know, weekend, I just reached out to a bunch of people that I worked with in mm-hmm. those days, you know, at Goldman and just said, you know, what are you guys doing? Mm-hmm. You know, help, you know, like, are you experiencing this? I'm experiencing that. How are you helping your leaders in your company? Mm-hmm. Right? You haven't really talked about it in this level of raw emotion. Right. right that was mm-hmm. going on. I just want to compare. So there were some people I haven't talked to for years, mm-hmm. but you know, Within, but, you know, I remember sitting there with, with my husband saying, oh, I just reached out to so-and-so. I had been a long time. Five minutes later, you know, I got an email. That, right. Yeah, I can talk in an hour. Yeah, no problem. Uh-huh. And so to me, that really solidified, um, you know, those connections because we had probably been through a lot, you know, during our times together. And right. People were there. And um, I always had a slight hesitation, you know, mm-hmm. but, respond will they you know and uh you know i think the the relationships that were strong well here we are right right absolutely Uh (laughs) right now you know you know connecting on this again and and it's great and i think what you make is extremely critical point because i think one thing that i've noticed with the women that i've worked with and um when it comes to community they don't leverage their community as much as Mm -hmm. they should they don't tap into their community because there is this sense of I don't want to compl- always be taking, which I think is is really a limiting belief that, you know, at the end of the day, like you said, there's always that hesitancy of reaching out. Um, but when you do, you're pleasantly surprised that, you know, everybody's always willing to help and come forward and, and do whatever it takes um, because there's that, that level of trust that you mentioned. I have another question in terms of level of trust. And I think this is something that I, you know, personally found very um, beneficial for me in that trust of that kind of mentoring, sponsoring relationship that I had with you in our days at Goldman was Mm -hmm. um, it's very rare that you find the truth tellers, the people who will pull you aside and say, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Because, you know, and I know this may be hard for you to swallow, but if you don't do this, you're going to fall flat on your face. And so I always appreciated those moments where you would pull me aside and say, you know, you need to do X, Y, and Z so that when you go in front of this group again, you are going to, you know, shine opposed to, you know, come across feeling, you know, that like you didn't really accomplish what you were supposed to accomplish. How do you you know, one, I always appreciated that in you because I knew I could always come to you and say, okay, tell me how it is <laughs> because everybody else is kind of sugarcoating it. Um, but how do you develop those types of relationships or how do you develop that, that kind of trust? I think, look, it's with, with any relationships, I said before, it's, it's two-way. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, the first realization, mm-hmm. right? That no matter if you're how many levels senior or not, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter, right? You know, it, mm-hmm. it, 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 both, part, both parties in the relationship are, are going to get something out of it. Right. Um, I don't know. I just think that, uh, first of all, that's just maybe innately, that's kind of who I am, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, you know, I genuinely wanted people to succeed, mm-hmm. right? And I think, you know, um, viewing that we're just all need, if you succeeded, I succeeded, mm-hmm. okay? Right. Mm-hmm. Like if I succeeded, you will succeed as right. well. Mm-hmm. And I think there's not enough of that thinking. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in companies, right? Because it feels a little bit cutthroat all the time. But, yes, yes. And I think sometimes there's a view that there's only one way to be mm-hmm. successful, and that's just this upward ladder. Mm-hmm. And you know me long enough, right? I don't think that's exactly how the mindset people should have. Mm-hmm. And I do worry that there's, um, there's a lot of titling culture and mindset going on. Right. And, you know, you have to be a little bit egoless, I guess, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to be okay with it. But, um, yeah, that's, you know, and I think, you know, where company cultures, you know, the ones that are successful, mm-hmm. take a little bit, you got to take that ego out a little bit. But, you know, realize that if one person's successful here, that person will be successful there. And then the mm-hmm. next day it might be switched around. So I think that, you know, and also, I would also say that I probably got straightforward feedback about myself, too, from mm-hmm. you know, different points in my career and thought it was beneficial. So I'll just tell a really quick, you know, story. Yeah. So around the time that I was moving into, you know, the people space from tech, you, know, you mm-hmm. have to also realize in tech, it's sharp elbowed, it's, you know, <laughs> You know, plus not many women around the table. I was mm-hmm. also working with the traders, mm-hmm. right? Trading floor. Right. So it was like, you got to be there. Right. Mm-hmm. And as I was transitioning into like, you know, especially as we uh, brought up the human capital management division and I kind of said, you know, this is where mm-hmm. I'm doing my career. Uh, people didn't know who came up more from the HR side of the world didn't right. know what to do with me. Okay. <laughs> you know what to make of me, right? And so someone gave me very blunt advice. They said, you know, you ask too many, Gail, you know, your reputation is that um, you ask too many questions, right? And that people feel that, you know, you're not supporting them, mm. right? That you don't, you don't support the idea. That right. They, you know, I was like devastated like, <laughs> when I heard that because uh-huh. it was absolutely – the complete opposite. Right. right? So I, so, you know, the, you know, as a technology, your brain works 10 steps ahead Mm -hmm. to solve the problem before it gets to be a problem. Right. right? So Mm -hmm. you're always, in order to do that, you have to ask a lot of questions. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So (laughs) that was, you know, Mm -hmm. my DNA. I mean, I, you know, so as I was meeting new people, and you may, this may have happened with when you first met me, I probably uh-huh. said, you know, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions now. Mm-hmm. That's a good thing. You need yes. to worry if I don't <laughs> ask you any questions. <laughs> right, when exactly. we get questions, we're going to make it better. Right, <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> so that was, you know, uh, you know, how I think it was a way for me to make it safe, mm-hmm. right, for people to come in and, get to know me and right. work together and see my style very uh, upfront. <laughs> no, I love that. And I, and I will say that those are actually some very um, wonderful lessons learned that I learned in, in just working with projects of, you know, learning to ask better questions and more proactive questions so that, mm-hmm. like you said, you are kind of, you've already played that scenario out in your head before the problem even occurred. And, mm-hmm. um, and I will say that that was something that I, I learned from you in terms of tra- opera- operationalizing things, but then <laughs> being able to, being able to then forecast. And mm-hmm. I think that was, that was, you know, something that I took away with me and I've used it over and over mm-hmm. and I have you to thank for it. Um, <laughs> but, and, and so, I will say thank you because I, I do think that way now. It became part of my DNA. Um, 
Now, I do want to ask in terms of, you know, that was something that kind of like a, a ritual or something that you always did that made you successful. What are other, you know, daily habits or rituals that you have um, to, that help you continue your career success? So what is the day in the life of Gail, like just preparing for oh. you know, being successful? Yeah, I mean, I try to, first of all, I'm trying to keep my calendar organized. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's number one. Mm-hmm. Um, but something I, I try to carry with me from the days as a, as a new mom, mm-hmm. right? after I had my, my son. And someone said to me, uh, it was a senior woman uh, at Goldman. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, treat your um, home, personal, your family as your most important meeting. Mm. And I'm sure many people, you and I know, have heard me say that to them as right. well. Right, yes. It stuck with me, mm-hmm. right? And so um, I really tried to make sure I had time Mm-hmm. Uh, when my son was young, very young, and I was also traveling mm-hmm. a lot. But um, like in the early grade school years, he, you know, the parents were, you know, in New York City, so you walk to school, and the uh, parents were allowed to stay for the first 30 minutes, mm-hmm. you know, of drop off from like, you know, up until through second grade or something. Right. And it so. Uh, bothered me <laughs> as a working mom uh-huh. you know, not to be able to participate in that. But every Friday, mm-hmm. I made sure I was able to do it. Mm. Right? And just you know, came in a little bit late. And I told people, you know, I was coming in a little bit late because I'm dropping my son. I'm spending the first 30 minutes. Now, when third grade came and they no longer did that, I was very <laughs> relieved. But, um, <laughs> uh-huh. but I, that notion of carving out time Mm-hmm. for whatever, and not just personal time, but I try to make sure that I stay connected, especially mm-hmm. now being remotely. Mm-hmm. Where I can't just, you know, have that informal, um, you, know, to, you know, hello in the kitchen or right. walking around the, the office. You have to book time with people. And I really want to stay connected to everyone at Castle at every level. Mm-hmm. So I try to book out, you know, an hour or two a week where I'm just kind of having those check-ins. Mm-hmm. And I really think about that in, in the kind of my planning, like right? keeping that calendar. Right. You know, thing. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's a bit of the, you know, just creating some boundaries around uh, a, a yeah. time and a space that's non-negotiable um, in order to kind of uh, be able to integrate that work life kind of um, that, you know, I don't say balance anymore because I've learned no. it's definitely, from, <laughs> you can't really separate the two. So it's definitely integrating and setting those boundaries. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and I can attest to remembering on, you know, certain days where you were like, you know, I, I will be there, but like, can we push this meeting or this call out mm-hmm. to a little later in the afternoon? And um, which I think is leading by example, because then it kind of showed, you know, others working with you, whether they were peers or, you know, people below you that, you know, there is room to set boundaries in order mm-hmm. to do those things that are important. So I think that's fantastic. Well, one question we love to ask all of our our guests um, in closing is, you know, given this current environment in this day and age where there's digital disruption and just disruptions of, you know, everything you can think of from pandemic to, you know, uh, just social causes and things that, you know, really do change the way that you uh, show up and come to work. Um, how can women accelerate their success in the digital age, knowing that there's always going to be, you know, these disruptions coming, whether it's just technology based or just, you know, world events. Yeah. Um, I actually think this like moment in time is where women can really thrive. Right. Mm. I think that our, you know, there was, there's all sorts of brain studies, right. That how women <laughs> think differently, you know, than men, Mm-hmm. And I think those differences, right, how we process information and how we build relationships mm-hmm. um, are the key ingredient, the secret sauce, right, in right. this sort of digital age. And so women should just, like, 
embrace it and go for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think the, um, this learning mindset, this growth mindset mm -hmm. is absolutely key. And, you know, it kind of goes back to how we were talking, you know, our conversation, right? You know, mm -hmm. how do you always learn, right? Mm -hmm. you know, understanding where you need to stretch is a learning moment, right? right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that's number one, you know, that's really, really key. But to contextualize it in a little bit more in this digital age, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, this is about, you know, things change, the pace of change is so mm -hmm. quickly. Right. So quick, right. So you need to stay on top of it. Mm. Right? And, you know, I'll be honest, you know, uh, you know, I have not, I'm adjusting personally to how fast social media right. form an opinion mm -hmm. and how fast uh, it could actually, you know, fix itself too. Mm -hmm. Right. By right. being out there, you know, there's, you know, a couple of moments where, you know, recently during, again, during this whole spring Black Lives Matter, where things were being posted on our company's, you know, Instagram, mm -hmm. and my first reaction was like, get the lawyers, you know, right. <laughs> and, uh <-huh>. and, <laughs> and someone else's reaction was, well, I just responded X, Y, Z, and it's taken care of now, right? You right. know, like, mm -hmm. the, the whole, like, tone changed. I'm like, so I'm getting used to that mm -hmm. fast paceness, and you have to kind of just dive in, mm -hmm. staying really current. And I, going back to, again, one of those things that women uh, are good at, at these building, you know, building relationships, but bridging. Mm. Right? Building bridges oh. and building solutions. And I think that um, is another, it's, it's a, a slightly different take on just networking and building relationships. It, it's right. more about, say, a problem solving forward. Right. Okay kind of connotation to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, taking that more kind of intuitive and innate capability of building relationships and having empathy mm -hmm. uh, for people, but building the bridges around that. And, you know, that last point is about also about empathy. You know, it's all about the human experience. Right. Right. Technology is there to support the human experience. And sometimes mm -hmm. I think we kind of get lost with that. So those are, things that I think really come naturally to women mm -hmm. uh, and can leverage more in this, uh, during this very fast paced digital moment. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's extremely enlightening. And I do believe that there are some, like you said, innate abilities that women bring where, like you said, creating that bridge and keeping the human touch in some of the some of these kind of new kind of technologies where sometimes you feel like it could become very stale um, and so making sure that we we continue to lay that bridge where you know we bring some of the humanity and keep that empathy in there so Gail thank you so much for giving the time this has been um, a true kind of delight for me and uh, now I will have this evergreen podcast to whenever I need my fix of of Gail pearls of wisdom I can listen to over and over <laughs> but I certainly appreciate you taking the time and um, sharing with our listeners all of the things that made you successful and hopefully they will glean from that and put some of that into practice and benefit as well. well Monica thank you so much I really had a blast. <laughs> thank awesome. you. Thanks Gail. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.